Last week, the federal government met with Indigenous leaders to discuss disturbing accounts of racism within Canada's health care system. Those conversations were happening at the same time as escalating tensions on the East Coast and concerns about violence against Mi'kmaq fishermen in Nova Scotia. Joining me now to discuss this is Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Bellegarde. Good morning, Chief Bellegarde, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for the opportunity to be here, Mercedes. You had an opportunity to meet with some of the Indigenous and political leadership in Canada on Friday, talking about discrimination in the Canadian health care system. This, of course, comes after that shocking video uh, that was just before the death of Joyce Estaquan, how she was treated in a hospital in Quebec. It has led mm -hmm. to calls for an inquiry, calls for criminal charges, calls for accountability in the health care system. What came of that meeting, and, and are you satisfied that there is a plan to address the kind of racism that we're seeing in the healthcare system? Well, well, first off, uh, we lift up the, the ministers of the Crown, the federal government, that called for this meeting um, on Friday to talk about and listen, basically, to bear witness to a lot of uh, First Nations and Métis and Inuit doctors that are working in a healthcare system. And so we listened and we, we, we heard their stories, but we also listened to the husband of uh, Joyce Echequan, and uh, we heard his story as well, and the pain that he feels now that his wife has passed on. Um, and but so nobody in this country can deny that there's systemic racism or systemic discrimination in the healthcare system. It's a fact and it's real. The question now is, what are we going to do about it? So we listened all day on Friday to testimonies and, and everything else, experiences from from basically what Joyce Echequan experienced in Quebec. To, to Mr. Sinclair, who died in waiting for uh, health services in Winnipeg Hospital, to the guessing game in, in BC between the doctors and the nurses trying to guess the alcohol content of a First Nations person. So there's there are so many examples given. Now everybody's starting to focus on what are the answers? What are the solutions? So everything from looking at a first uh, an ombudsperson so that there is a place to go with these stories, looking at more accountability in the system, getting more First Nations nurses and doctors into the system, into positions of authority, uh, even looking at transfers to the provinces, that even the talk about looking at before these health care monies are transferred to the provinces and territorial governments, that they have a plan on how to deal with systemic discrimination in the health care system. And so that was talked about. And there was another date picked in January to come back with some real concrete recommendations how to deal with this systemic racism in the healthcare system. What is your position on the transfers to the provinces? Because as you were mentioning there, some Indigenous Canadians believe that the federal government should refuse to make those transfers or should make them contingent on the provinces actually having a plan to deal with racism against Indigenous Canadians in their healthcare system. Well, anything that you can use to put pressure on the provincial and territorial governments to have a plan in place should be looked at. And so you got to look at the whole Canadian transfer uh, health transfer agreement, the CH CHTA, and that has to be looked at. And whether it requires policy or legislative change to make that a requirement, that that's one of the tools that you should look at in the toolbox. Because again, the provincial governments will say healthcare is a provincial jurisdiction. While a lot of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people access that healthcare system, but right now there's they're just not getting the proper services and treatment. And so that's very real. And so we have to look at every avenue, every tool we can to bring about systemic change into a system that really is systemic racism and discrimination against First Nations people. So that's one of the tools Like before you transfer these billions of dollars, that there should be a very concrete action plan in place on how to deal with this so that this no longer happens again. It's 2020, for goodness sake. We all need to have good quality health care, every one of us from coast to coast to coast. I want to turn our attention as well to what's happening with the Mi'kmaq fishermen in Nova Scotia uh, and this escalating violence and tension. Have you been satisfied with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's response on this? Well, it's moving in the right way, Mercedes. This is a longstanding issue. Uh, you've got a recent Supreme Court decision 21 years ago, the Marshall decision, which is a, the highest court of this land that recognized the Mi'kmaq fisher people's right to fish. You know, it's an inherent right. It's a treaty right. It's contained in Section 35 of Canada's Constitution, which recognizes existing Aboriginal treaty rights. So the implementation of that right has to be moving into the right way. And so Chief Michael Sack, under his own jurisdiction, has issued licenses and permits. So it's a, it's a lawfully regulated fishery. And so 
there's two things that have to happen on the East Coast right now. One, we have to make sure that there's calm heads and, and cooler heads come together so that there's peace on the ground. And that's where we call on the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to do their job because we witnessed a van that was burned, no charges. We seen a physical assault on Chief Michael Sack, no charges. Two people were, were barricaded in a building against their will, no charges. This is not acceptable. So there's an issue of public safety that must be addressed immediately. Then the next issue would be a process to work with the Mi'kmaq Nation to define what moderate livelihood means. And again, this is not a, a conservation issue because the Mi'kmaq fishery accesses 1% of the total lobster fishery out on the East Coast. So it's more in the sense of how does everybody start working together to peacefully coexist and everybody benefit from that resource that's there. So defining that moderate livelihood is the next big step going forward. And that's where DFO comes into play, Department of Fisheries and Ocean, to start working with the leadership in that territory. One last question. Can you give us an update on what the situation is in terms of COVID-19 with Indigenous communities? I know there's been a lot of concern because of crowded living conditions, lack of access to health care, uh, remote areas. What is the situation in terms of the impact of COVID-19 right now? Again, uh, we're all in the, in the second wave of COVID-19. Uh, we've always said once it hits First Nations communities, especially in the flying communities, it's going to be devastating um, because there is overcrowded housing and lack of access to potable water. Um, we'll, we'll lift up the, 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 the federal government for putting resources out, and we want to make sure that that keeps happening to be responsive to the health care needs that are going to be identified. And so when we start talking about COVID-19, uh, there's outbreaks in northern Manitoba. There's outbreaks at Six Nations Reserve. We have to make sure that they have the adequate fin uh, financial resources in place to meet their health care needs. But the simple message to everybody in Canada and even First Nations people is simple. Keep your social distancing. Make sure you continue to wash your hands. Wear the masks and, and make sure that we, we're all in this together. So we have to respect that going forward. We've said before that amongst First Nations communities, because of overcrowded housing, because of lack of access to potable water, this is going to be even bigger for our people. And so those needs should be recognized and the needs should be met with adequate human and financial resources going forward. National Chief Bellegarde, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again for the opportunity, Mercedes.